Welcome everybody to Mindful Social. And this week I have the most amazing friend of mine and who happens to live very nearby. We don't spend a lot of time together, but we're gonna have to work on that. Mm -hmm. Courtney Smith Kramer. And Courtney, I would like you to kind of describe uh, the book that you've just written. Give us the full title, please. <laughs> well, the full title is right here, 21 Reasons uh, Creativity is Like Sex. Uh, it does have a much longer subtext after it, which is um, why everyone can do it and have a sense of humor about it and use it to make the world a better place. Yay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you are also co-founder of Pure Matter and creative director. Is that correct? Yeah, I am the uh, co-founder and executive creative director for Pure Matter, which is um, an ever-evolving <laughs> agency <laughs> in air quotes, um, meaning that, you know, like all creative services uh, firms out there, you kind of have to roll with what the market is wanting um, just without losing your core skill set. So we started out as uh, an interactive, I guess sort of the first integrated, you know, agency, meaning uh, interactive and traditional design and branding, which is my background. And um, Brian Kramer, my life partner, business partner, um, husband, uh, he has a uh, an interactive background, so we sort of melded our skill sets together um, uh, 16 years ago. Can you believe it? Wow! I know <laughs> we're like dinosaurs in this business, anyway. Um, and then over the years, it sort of you know morphed as the market morphed. So then we started doing more solely interactive, and print kind of went by the wayside. And then when social media came into to play. Um, Brian, that was at the time where he really started building his personal brand and trying to, you know, get under the hood of social media. So um, that's when we started pointing our agency in that direction. And so today we are a social content marketing and influencer marketing agency. Wow. It's really fun to see how businesses have evolved because, you know, we started around that same time. And, you know, seeing the d different transitions that businesses are going through, and we're the ones that are still here. And a lot of the agencies that we started with simply aren't, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and how have you seen, as, as creative director, how have you seen things change over the last 16 years? Well, it's funny, um, you know, I judge a lot of creative competitions all over the country. And... Um, the, the core essence of what makes people react, you know, either positively, negatively, crying, laughing, whatever, to try to move them towards a purchase of something, um, which is what our job is, right, as marketers, um, that the core essence hasn't necessarily changed at all. You know, the, the same things touch people. Um, it's the connecting with that common human experience mm -hmm. that, that has not gone away at all. What I've seen change is the, the channel delivery. <laughs> the, mech <laughs> the mechanism to which that, that creative is delivered. And, um, you know, as uh, someone who's trained in traditional design, initially that could be a very scary place because not understanding technology and feeling limited by my lack of knowledge about technology, you know, and this was about around, I don't know, 2007, 2008, you know, when, when things were really starting to change and, you know, these multimedia ad sets were starting to come into play and interesting, I don't know, whiz bang gizmos. I don't know what they call them. <laughs> technical term people. <laughs> technical term. You can put them on websites and, you know, all of this functionality, which led, you know, many creative agencies to have to have heads of technology or, you know, digital masters or, I mean, you name the title, it, it was all over the place, but someone who understood what that technology was and then how we could integrate that into our own creative messaging mm -hmm. you know, to really complement each other, you know, in a new and, and interesting way. So to me, that, that's what's really changed. It, it hasn't necessarily been any of the things that I would even consider um, creativity or creative, you know, which is all just connecting with that human spirit. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So in, in your book, you have a thing that you call the empathy map. And, you know, I'd like to talk about that because I think it really buys into, you know, what we're talking about is that, you know, you are really 
trying to put yourself, put your designs forward mm -hmm. kind of in the head of the person that you're attracting rather than as some designers might want to do what they want to do. <laughs> Can you talk oh, a little yes. bit more about the empathy map? <laughs> yeah. So there's, there's a bunch of different tools um, that you can use uh, to try to get into the heads of your audience, but the empathy map is a great one because what it does is it, it helps you understand from multiple perspectives what someone might be feeling, mm -hmm. what they might be hearing, what they might be saying, and did I said feeling? Yeah, or what they might be doing. So, so what you can do is say, for instance, um, you have a, a scenario and you think, okay, say it's product design and you've designed this product for a specific audience. And then you can say, okay, let's see if we can get into the head of our audience a little bit more. Um, let's, let's paint a persona and say, this is, you know, Sue and she's 40 years old and how might she react to this product? So when you can quadrant it out, you can say, okay, how, how is Sue feeling? Like what does her environment look like? And you can start to just almost lightning round. This is, an exercise best done with a group of people and you can start to lightning round down like I don't know maybe she's feeling nervous or maybe she's feeling um, irrelevant in her industry or maybe mm -hmm. she's feeling um, you know excited about what what might come you know in her new career or whatever and then you can start to plot those up about okay well that's how she's feeling now let's think about what she's saying and then you can actually verbalize like like, I'm not really sure what I'm doing, but I have to fake it till I make it, you know, and then start putting up some other things that she might be saying. And then what might she be doing? Maybe it's she's trying to seek online courses to try to, you know, learn a new skill, or maybe she's thinking about going back to school or, you know, or, or, or. So it, the great thing about this is it helps you get a much more robust 360 degree picture of what this person in their audience might be experiencing meaning in the full sense of the word with all of their senses. And it helps inform a much better product design because, you know, empathy, the empathy map is a key tenant in what's called design thinking mm -hmm. and design thinking is a, a different way to approach any type of development, meaning product development or, you know, design or anything, which means that you start with the outcome, and you work backwards. So a good example of this would be, um, say, if I ask you to draw me a vase, then probably 95% of the room is going to draw something that looks like this, right? Mm -hmm. Something that looks like a traditional vase because that's what I've asked you to draw. But if I, if I ask you to draw me a, a vessel that can hold flowers, then it makes you think, well, I don't have any limitations. And, you, and someone might draw a vase, but someone else might draw a table that has you know, slots that are cut out into the middle of the table. Or someone might design a, a clear wall that would go on the side of your house that just had m micro holes in it that you could just put flowers in. You know, mm -hmm. So that, that's sort of the, an easy, quick way to describe design thinking, but the empathy map is one of those, they call them hills that you have to cross. And the empathy map is one of the hills um, that you need to go through in order to, you know, get to that desired outcome that you want to achieve. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, it's a really interesting process to really kind of put yourself in that person's shoes and try to understand, you know, where they're coming from. Uh, you know, we're not marketing for ourselves. And I, I think that's one of the challenges that, you know, we as creative directors kind of struggle with because we have to manage what the client wants. We have to manage what the designer wants to do. And we have to manage what that avatar is, is interested in. And yeah. sometimes it's not always easy to, to bring all those three or many things together. Um, how does, how does that process work for you? What, what challenges have you encountered in that kind of, I call it translation mode? <laughs> right, right. Well, I feel fortunate because I know at least in my experience, we have had strategic thinkers who bring to the, the, the table some market research experience and understand the value of that. So the way that we've structured our business 
in the past for our clients is when we approach a, a campaign or you know a, a design or anything that our clients are asking of us we require that there be an upfront research component not mm -hmm. intense research meaning you know do you have any anecdotal information from your customers you know tell us what they're saying um, let's talk to the salespeople and let's find out what their challenges are. Let's get your business goals and let's find out what your business goals are. Let's do some research about your industry and not just your industry, but also adjacent industries. Let's look at some other models that they're doing that we might be able to use and apply here. Mm -hmm. So we take all of this information and we create our sort of triad Venn diagram, right? So we always have to get the voice of the customer, the voice of the company, and the voice of the industry. And we'll filter through all of this research, pl plot it in our three quadrants here in our Venn diagram, and then find what we call the sweet spot, which is that overlapping uh, set of values or set of uh, perspectives that each one of those circles have in them. And what that does for us is it helps to validate, okay, all three audiences here are going to be in alignment with these values. So let's start with these values in the creative brief and then take that to the designer to say this this is what the design needs to achieve here are the values or the feelings that it needs to represent and then that way we can move forward with confidence to say we're not guessing we're not putting ourselves projecting ourselves into the target audience mm -hmm. without being informed maybe we are in the target audience but at least it's been informed and everyone has a voice at that table so it's kind of that step beforehand and I, I feel like there's I, I've witnessed many you know design firms or ad agencies that really glaze over that step you know they'll just rush right to the design as that first as that first component and for us the design happens in the middle because we need we absolutely I need to at least to feel confident that we're that we're pointing our, our creative lens in the right direction because otherwise you know, it's, it's not going to be as strategic or as successful as it could be. Well, and that's a very, it's, it's a great way to do business because you're really making it very customer focused and, and user focused, where, as you said, some agencies are so design focused that it's, hey, this is it. You know, if you don't like it, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I've encountered that many times in my history where, you know, the designer is like, yeah, but, but they're wrong. And so, you know, how do you balance that? Um, you know, because if creativity is like sex, you don't want to just chop it off and say, okay, it's not working. We got to go over here now. Let, let me be clear. There should be no chopping off when it comes to sex. <laughs> oh, never. Clearly. Clearly. <laughs> but, you know, it's really, it's hard to, to kind of break that flow and, you know, then you're not going to get as good work from the creative because they're pissed. Yeah. Well, to me, it's setting the designer up for success, right? So mm -hmm. the more information you can get and to help them inform their design choices, then the better. And, you know, designers, and I can say this because I am one, I understand, I was young once, <laughs> <laughs> I understand, um, you know, that... Like, you feel it's important to designers as visual artists to, to want to bring their very best work to the table, right? Absolutely. And so, to, to, and it is an art, it really is. And, you know, but it, it can't be uninformed. You know, it, it needs to have a point of view. And, and in the business of creativity, you know, then that point of view needs to be in line with what the client is asking you to help them with which mm -hmm. is it which is create something that's going to resonate with my customer you know or my employees or whatever whoever their audience is but that that's really at the end of the day that's the ask so you know if we can set our designers up for with for more success with more information that's pointed in the right direction then i, I feel like it's a win-win yeah i think that's that's really great and and absolutely spot on and, and a good way for any agency to approach things. And that level of research is, is hugely important and yeah. not very often done. Well, and, but to your point, so you asked me what the challenges are. The challenge with that is oftentimes the client's not willing to pay for it. Mm -hmm. 
So that's, that's a big challenge where it, sometimes it, it, it's a, a loss leader <laughs> as a cost center. Um, but if the end result's going to be better, I would just say, you know, do it anyway. And even just like, don't tell the client that you're doing it, but do it for yourself and do it for the work. Mm -hmm. Well, and it, did you get a better understanding of, of the goals of the client? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know, we see that a lot where the client's like, well, what do you need that for? Just do it. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Then you're going to get crap. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So you also talk about mind mapping in the book, and I think that's another tool that, that you can use. At what point do you bring the designers in to that discussion so that they can have input on the process as it's evolving? Or is it something that you do and then hand to them, go, okay, here's what you're going to do? Oh, no, no, not at all. <laughs> I, I feel like, <laughs> you know, it, it's always a better environment when everyone is taken along on the journey. Mm -hmm. You know, not everyone in the agency, but everyone who has a stake in, in the, in the process. So, you know, it, in our brainstorming sessions, certainly we have, we have a, what we call a flat organization. So, which means anyone is welcome to come to any brainstorming session if they want, because good ideas can come from anywhere and we, and different perspectives are always going to enrich the work. So, um, I would say absolutely include the designer early on, include the writer, include the account manager, include a strategist, include an admin, who knows, you know, mm -hmm. I, I feel like, you know, within reason, having the right people in the room, meaning people that have a stake in what that project is and what the outcome is, is always a better idea because then everyone also feels like they get their voice heard you know, which is an important part of just people management, not just designer or creative management, but, you know, letting people say what they need to say and then take it or leave it, you know, which is why there needs to be a filter <laughs> yeah. to be able to say like, okay, thank you know, that that's really interesting. You know, let, let's now take this away. And I, I, I think the mind mapping thing is another good tool with a lot of people in the room because you can explore different scenarios and, for people that don't know what mind mapping is, it's kind of like that exercise that you did if you ever took a creative writing class in college, you know, which is like you start out with a singular idea. Ooh, the phone's ringing. <laughs> I was like, what is that? There's a phone? Who has those anymore? I know, right? <laughs> but, uh, will ring. I know, right? And I don't know how to silence it. Hmm. So, Just let it go. Be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but mind mapping is one of those um, exercises where you start out with that singular idea, you know, written in the center of, of one circle, and then you start exploring different scenarios, you know, so you can say, I don't know, throw out a scenario. Of course, now I'm blanking about what a scenario would be. How about getting a phone to stop ringing? There you go. <laughs> there you go. You got it now. So you can say, all right, how do you get a phone to stop ringing? And then you can start saying, okay, well, we could unplug it from the wall. And then what happens if we unplug it from the wall? Well, then we might mess up the paint. And then if the paint needs to be replaced, that means we have to go to the store. And then if we go to the store, it means we have to get in the car. And we have, to, you know, so it's like, it's a, a very mindful approach, you know, to make you think through what exactly each of those scenarios would entail. And, you know, maybe another scenario would be to, knock it off the shelf or answer it. What happens if I answer it? I have to talk to someone. What if you don't want to talk to someone? Well, then you have to explain that, you know, so, so, that, so that's what mind mapping is. Yeah, and I, I use mind mapping a lot in a, a lot of my projects um, simply because it's a great way to stop interrupting yourself. You know, you just throw everything at it that you can possibly think of whether it's with mind mapping software, which is really great, or some people do it just with post-it notes. And then as you get all of those things on the wall, you can kind of start to group things together and, and really understand that, oh, okay, these things go together. These things we don't need to do. These are going to be essential to the product. And you may not have thought those if you didn't have other people to bounce things off of. It's very, very hard to mind map by yourself. Oh, I totally agree. And you know, um, there's this guy named Jeremy Gucci, and he founded Trend Hunter. Mm -hmm. 
And um, he, he's a really nice guy. We've met him a couple times. And, and he, um, I think on his website, I'll see if I can find it and I'll send you the link after this. But oh. on his website, he has a free, like a ebook that talks about um, some ways that people are using interesting ways to mind map um, to try to solve certain problems, right? So one of the examples that he gave was um, that don't mess with Texas campaign. You know, if you remember like years ago, Texas had a really bad litter problem, you know, on the side of their highways and they were trying to figure out how to, how to get rid of it. And so they said, you know, at first instinct, you're like, of course, who is doing this? Well, it's gotta be young guys that are probably sitting in the back of their trucks and they're riding oh, down the beer cans out. The beer cans over, right? <laughs> Well, what they were able to do is they, they went in and they did some, they did some research and yes, they were able to confirm that was the audience there, but then they also were able to, to take sort of that mind mapping or the, the regrouping, mm -hmm. you know, you group things together in certain categories. A lot of people could just take that as, well, we're done. This is great. Okay. Well, what he explains is you can't, you can't stop there. You need to take all those groups and then re-slice it. It's almost like turning it on its side and picking out other more interesting connections that aren't as obvious. Mm. You know, so what they found when they did this is that there was a lot of pride in their like their football teams or like the, the people who had come out of Texas. And so they were able to come up with this don't mess with Texas, but they used like all of their their prize, you know, professional football players, and they use their um, I can't remember the country singer's name. Anyway, um, so they Alan Jackson. So they used mm -hmm. Alan Jackson to come and, and made commercials. And in a year, littering had gone down by seventy one percent, or some wow. crazy number like that, right? Just because they were able to to reassociate those connections in a way that made it more meaningful to the audience mm -hmm. you know, um, who, who they were trying to target. Oh, that's just brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, that's really brilliant. And that kind of brings me to another question that I had uh, in the book, because you talk about being a flow and ranger, <laughs> uh, which kind of speaks to this <laughs> about working alone and how that, how that all comes together. Yeah, well, the, a flown ranger, the flow is uh, in reference to getting into the flow. The flow is, is a concept that was introduced by a man, and I'm going to botch his last name because it has too many consonants in a row. <laughs> uh, Mihaly Szyszymhaly. <laughs> we'll find that and add a link in the blog post. <laughs> and I feel bad too. Because the man is still alive, so I apologize. Mm. If you ever see anything that I say, I have the utmost respect for you. I just don't know how to pronounce your last name. I wish someone would tell me. <laughs> um, but anyway, he, he sort of coined uh, that term, the flow, and what that is in reference to is, is that place where, you know, your eyes kind of roll back in your head and time and space kind of lose their traditional meaning. Mm -hmm. And, and you're, you're in that place where, you're at your you're able to access information that you wouldn't necessarily in your conscious state yeah and it, it's not a special gift it's something that everybody can do and it's just creating the environment and the right circumstances so that you can train yourself to get there so for me what being a flown ranger <laughs> is just um being mindful about creating those circumstances in the environment for yourself so that you can get into that state mm -hmm. to access that information that's dying to get through. And, and I happen to believe, you know, spiritually, I happen to believe that we all have, you know, guides who are helping us on the other side. And to me, that's where I, I get into the state where what they, I just merely become a vessel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> let's just put it that way like what mm -hmm. what what comes out on the on the page just because i i'm a writer right so what comes out on the page is i'll sort of come to after who knows you know and just looking at what i wrote and i'm like oh my god i wrote that like that's super <laughs> funny. like that wasn't coming for me like they're super for me i'm just i'm just recording it mm -hmm. <laughs>
you know, so, so that's what I, I was saying in reference. There's a story in the book that talks about George Lucas, you know, and when he's writing his movies and it, and it, it's like, you get really, really, <laughs> I'm just going to do this. Unplug the phone. Wait, I got to mind map this. <laughs> right? This was my second attempt. I actually just picked it up and hung up. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. If was that was you calling on the phone, she'll get back to you, okay? <laughs> Call back after the podcast. I promise I will pick it up. <laughs> um, but anyway, so George Lucas is talking about um, when he writes his movies, he can get to a place where he feels like he's, he's just scribing what he sees in his head. Like the characters are already alive. They're talking. He's furiously writing down what it is that they're saying. And that's being in a flow state where you, it, it's stepping aside of your ego and truly, truly letting yourself just observe and listen. And it, it, it takes some doing, but you can train yourself to, to get into that state. Anyone mm -hmm. can do it. I think I've learned that a lot from meditation too. You know, when I have something that I'm really struggling with, if I just stop thinking about it for a minute, even just a minute and just sit. Yep. And, you know, when you get done, you know, it's, it's amazing the things that will come to you. And it's really just enabling your mind to do what it's supposed to do instead of getting in its way. It's so oh. easy to get in our own way. It's so true. And, you know, the, the metaphor that I like to use for it is, do you, did you ever see that movie Contact with Jodie mm -hmm. Foster? So remember at the very end where they build this time machine and she's sitting in it and she doesn't know and, and she's barreling through this wormhole and everything's shaking, 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 shaking. And she's like trying to figure out, well, the minute she unbuckles her seatbelt, it's calm. Mm. She floats away and then the seat just like crumples up into the top of, of the, the spaceship. And there's, there's a commentary that says there was never a seat that was in the plans. That was something that humans decided, well, she needs a seat. Mm -hmm. We got to build it. Well, it's not in the plan, but we're going to build it anyway. And it's like, you don't need it. Just trust it. Yeah. Just you know? go with it. Just go with it. it it's mm -hmm. unknown and it's different and it's not anywhere you might've gone before, but just trust it. And you're going to be, just fine. In fact, you're going to be amazing. <laughs> it feels so good. It makes you feel connected and creative and like you're contributing and, and it helps you realize your purpose, you know, in, in this world. And that's so important for everybody to do. Yeah. I don't think anybody wants to feel like, you know, they don't have any impact or that what has come out of their creative moment is, not useful that there. I think you know there are people who are out there creating crap, yeah. But they're not doing it in their own space. They're mm -hmm. doing it because somebody's driving them to do it and has given them you know a little tiny box to sit in, and yeah. that's all they can do. And you know if we can open up to that, it can be really amazing. I totally agree. And and for anyone who is not in the creative services field. Um, I would suggest getting a side hustle. <laughs> get a side hustle. Does it have to be sex? Because not everybody can do that. <laughs> Just remember. <laughs> That's when we'll cover the book, folks. <laughs> yeah, here we go. Right there. There we go. <laughs> Which is a 21, by the way. Did you get that? I didn't. 21. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Well, I really enjoyed the book. I, I thought that it was a lot of fun and it, it opens up some doors that, you know, when you, when you pick up a book like that and, and you're reading through it and it's very visual, it's really got a nice flow to it, <laughs> but it really, it really does kind of break some of those things, you know, and, and allow you to move into a different mindset and really have some fun with it and not be so dry. It's not like a Photoshop manual. You know, it's much more, oh, thank God. <laughs> right. But it's, it's like opening to creativity. And, and if we'll just let ourselves do that, life is so much more interesting. Yeah, it sure it's is. So much more. Or more fun. I mean, come on, right. We need more fun in this world. We do. That's, especially now. And I'll tell you, I wrestled, I wrestled with, you know, my, Throughout my career, and I have done a lot of work with the American Advertising Federation, the AAF, and 
um, through all those years, my nickname was Chief of Fun, right? So I'll take it. Absolutely any day. You know, so, so um, then, you know, having a business alongside and then we work with some pretty serious clients, right? There was always that sort of wrestle, inner wrestling, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, like, wow, is this really in line with my purpose? Like, I feel like my purpose is to just help, like, remind people you can have fun with whatever you do and that everyone's creative. Like, that's it. It's okay to have that purpose. And it took me a long time to come to that realization. You know, like I felt like I needed to be more serious or I needed to be, you know, blah. <laughs> like all the yeah. Age is a beautiful thing. <laughs> when, when we get a little older and we stop freaking out, that's when we really have the opportunity to just kind of open up and go, screw it. This is me. This is what it is. And when you relax like that, all of a sudden you do so much better work. Oh my God. It's crazy. Right. It's so true. Yeah. I, I have, in fact, I don't know why this morning I was thinking about like, I was like, <laughs> this is welcome to my head. I was like, um, what would happen if my parents came to me and they said that like, I actually was 10 years younger than I am. Like, mm. what, how would I react if, if my parents said, we have something to tell you, like all of your memories, you're not actually like you're, you're 37 years old. You're not 47. <laughs> wow. It was like, you know what? I would be super sad. Like I, if I was 37, like looking at that perspective going, I want to be that age. Like, I don't want to be 37 again. Mm. Hell no. <laughs> I can't think of a year that I want to go back to. I really can't. No, you know, no, right, look, right now is it. And you've got a tween and I have a teenager. So no, don't want to go back there. <laughs> oh, right? oh my God. I mean, it just keeps getting better, right? Like every stage just keeps getting, I shouldn't say better, different, more interesting, more challenging, you richer. know, richer. Yeah. It gets richer. Yeah. yeah. Not necessarily better. <laughs> Some, some moments are better. <laughs> Perfection isn't that always the same. Well, okay. <sighs> right? Re, re, recenter. Reset. <laughs> it's really great talking to you, Courtney. And, and I, I would love for you to tell people, A, how they can get the book, uh, and also where they can find you online so that they can learn more from you. So you can get the book. As of two days ago, again on Amazon. Yay, she's not banned anymore. Or blacklisted, believe it or not, for adult content. <laughs> you know, I'm just saying, there is sex stuff in there, but it's not like some other things you can get on Amazon, which I was very quick to point out to my awesome helper, Ishmael, who was great. <laughs> Mm -hmm. get it on Amazon. <laughs> Thank you, Ishmael. Thank you, Ishmael. I was like, this whole like Ishmael, Moby Dick, Dick thing. <laughs> not on me. So ironic. You I just go there. Did you trying to find <laughs> anyway? So yeah, you can buy it on Amazon. You can just search for my name, which comes up now. <laughs> Yay. And you can get it on Barnes and Noble. It's only available in print. Uh, which is uh, a, a purpose conscious decision just because I feel like it's, meant to be fondled, <laughs> held in the hand. And um, I also feel like it like truly is manifested when it's in its physical form. So, mm. you know, get, get the, the physical copy. Um, and I will give you one, Janet. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> and uh, where you can find me online is uh, on Twitter uh, at CS has arrived. CS for Courtney Smith, CS has arrived uh, on Facebook forward slash Courtney Smith Kramer, LinkedIn. You can find me in all those places and my blog, Courtney Smith uh -huh. which I find infinitely more fun than my business blog, <laughs> <laughs> which talks about important stuff. Don't get me wrong. A lot of good marketing tips there, which is where that's at purematter.com. Mm. Uh, that is our agency website, and there's a bunch of great articles, including one by you that talks yes. about a and an elephant. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, but my my personal blog talks about sexy stuff. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I think it's really good to have that balance. You know, you gotta you gotta have the place where you write the stuff that's just for you, and and the place where you do business. It's just an easier way to keep that balance. Yeah, I agree. 
yeah. I agree. I, I guess I'm really sounding like a split personality right now, but <laughs> we all are. <laughs> Who's, who doesn't have 10 personalities? Come on. <laughs> Wait, oh, she's talking to me now. No, I gotta go. <laughs> um, thank you again. And, and uh, just to let everybody know, this will be up on the website, mindfulsocialmarketing.com. It will also be on my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash SM coaching, which is going to make Courtney giggle now. <laughs> and then uh, it'll also be on Spreaker on my podcast. So I hope you guys will tune in and give Courtney some love and go get that book. Thank you for having me, Janet. It's always so fun to talk to you. Thank you.